Mr. Jov Thompson. Jov Thompson. Jeff. How are you? <laughs> you can call me Jov. Okay. How are you doing, Jov? You okay? Very good. Thank you. Nice, nice. So I was like preparing for this, you know, saying to myself, everything needs to be perfect this morning. Uh, this morning ritual, you know, baseline routine. I wrote a full page of affirmation every morning. Well, that's one of the things I do anyway. Yeah. So I thought today we were going to speak about the power of self-transformation through various practices, like esoteric practices. And I got uh, quite a few uh, quite a few questions. So I've redacted them. So I hope you don't mind. I just I just go through that and then I'll let I'll let you speak. Yeah, just let's yeah. let's just be spontaneous and see where the spirit takes us. Cool, great. So the big shift often referred that spiritual awakening happens when a considerable amount of pain and suffering has been endured, and there is now a need to grow and to evolve on a spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical level and it is at this point that we find the roadmap within the heart yeah and we find we find that the heart speaks and when we decide to give it a voice it has a lot of very interesting things to say and it will always give us a honest answer it won't ever lie and um you know indigo star seeds our mission is to elevate human consciousness but since the great work of alchemy is a very personal inner work, we can only focus inward, meaning that we can only spend our time pointing the finger at us rather than pointing the finger at other people. So the light versus darkness, giving versus taking light work versus shadow work, where do we stand and how do we accomplish all this? That's a good summation. Um, I remember you from the Coombe talk and you asked some great questions, some really intelligent questions. <clears throat> so, as you said, we've got to start with ourselves. Uh, sometimes the epiphany comes in a moment of clarity and it's heaven and we're floating. Um, another and, you know, another times it comes through crisis, but both of them lead to the same place. My first epiphany came after a period of fear, a period of, well, I've had lots of epiphanies, but of varying degrees, but each time, whether it came as a, you know, like a force of heaven or a force of hell, it still demanded the same thing, that I contract in order to expand, yeah. make more room to become a cleaner vessel. So the work was always on the self and there was always something to work on with the self. So for me, it was about recognizing <clears throat> I tended to concentrate at one point on trying to fix the world and trying to get rid of the corruption in the world and try to protect people from the darkness in the world. Yeah. Um, but I recognise that uh, the corrupt politician, the greedy banker, the um, you know the, the violent fundamentalist, he was in me. I didn't have to go far below the surface to see that he was in me. So I didn't need to worry about what was projected into the world. I needed to come back to the projector. I needed to look at the film. The light coming through it was beautiful. The light coming through it was, through it was pure, but it was hitting the film of my cognitions, my perceptions, my beliefs, the precepts, the concepts, my culture, all of those little images on the screen of my mind were projecting my reality. So when we go out into the world and we try to fix the world at the level of the screen, so if you imagine we're, if you imagine you're at the cinema and you're looking at a horror film, you can go and adjust the screen all you want and you can move the screen and alter the screen. It won't make no difference. You can attack the screen. You can pull the screen down. It will just project onto the wall. Yeah. So we don't get rid of the images by, by altering the screen. We come back to the projector. We don't try and change the light. God is perfect. The light is perfect. We just need to change the filters it comes through. So for me, with my awakening, I felt like Odysseus coming back from the Trojan Wars to his kingdom in Ithaca, only to find that it was overrun by vagabonds and by criminals. And mm -hmm. he wasn't recognized in his own kingdom. Nobody knew him. Even his servants didn't recognize him. So it's a great metaphor for waking up. So we wake up, Julian. 
and we go i'm this is my kingdom i'm i'm in this body this is my vessel i represent god through this vessel but we realize i'm not in charge of this vessel i'm not in control of this vessel I, I know i can change the world from this vessel but at the moment i haven't got enough control to change my own waistline i can't change my own negative habits i'm still addicted to sexual pornography or i'm still attracted to violence mm. i'm still gossiping you know i still i haven't got control of my food body I haven't got control of my breast body i haven't got control my mind or my intellect has become lazy i haven't got control of my cause my causal body the causation so you recognize that you've woke up but you don't have any control over all your territories and mm. nobody in your body recognizes that and your body is rebelling against you all the time so you want to get your palate right you want to give up cigarettes or you want to give up alcohol um, or you want to go training or you want to get up early in the morning you want to be kinder to your wife or you want to stop gossiping and murdering your friends outside costa but you can't stop yourself because you're not you, although you are the um latent king you have no sovereignty yeah so when we awaken that's when the work begins as you so rightly suggested so when we wake and we go okay so i've got this kingdom i'm aware that through this kingdom i have the ability to create in the world i have a causal body so i'm going to i need to win that all of these territories back so we start with the obvious i haven't got control of the food body people don't understand that palate is powerful because the devil or the darker forces live in palate so mm. when we overeat when we overdrink when we take too much alcohol or we take drugs or we imbibe negativity from all of the different forces around us not least the world wide web we corrupt the physical body especially with overeating and overdrinking and any kind of uh, substance abuse so we corrupt the physical body that weakens the breath body that makes the mind and the intellect lazy and mm. it disables the will force so our, our autonomy is basically stolen to the food we eat so we start by winning our causal body back by winning our, our food body back and to do that we have to exercise our will force when we exercise our will force we want to get our food body right we need to educate ourselves i need to understand why i'm doing this i need to search for the purpose for this um so we start to we start to eat healthy we start to contract all the negative foods and we start and our consciousness automatically starts to expand mm -hmm. then consciousness wakes up as you said and says right this is jeff or this is julian this is where he is this is where he wants to be this is this is his potential to work within this lifetime this is the speed he can go at this is this is the level of commitment he's got and then it starts to say okay you have a problem with this habit so get rid of that so you go to war with that so you don't boot it out necessarily what you do is you recognize that every fear every anxiety every bad habit um you know every vice contains light and our job is to convert that into mm -hmm. convert that darkness into light transmutation the yeah. transmutation yeah so it contains light julian but it also blocks light but and it also filters light so if i've got a dark perception and the light of god comes through me it's going to go through that perception so yeah. i need to remove it because it contains light it blocks the natural flow of light you've got to keep the flow moving all the time just the same as with the blood system um, and when I remove it, it also creates a vacuum. It creates a vacancy in me that will be filled with light. Yeah. Once it's filled with light, and that becomes my new filter. So I'm not looking through the filter of a negative perception. I'm looking through the filter of love, of service. <clears throat> yeah. I recognize that what I think, what I say, what I do are causatory tools. Mm -hmm. what i think and say and do will have an effect in the world so i don't allow myself ever to think negatively i don't allow myself to to speak blasphemously or or negatively i don't allow myself to act negatively because i recognize i understand that i understand the fixed law in this moving planet and the fixed law is causation what i put out it's not just that we put out something and it returns that's definite 
It's that what we put out is spirit. If I put light out through a negative filter, it's going to enter the world as a dark spirit and it's going to go to work as a dark spirit and it's going to destroy the potential of the crystallization of light. So I, I train myself uh, not to think negative thoughts, to keep myself in constant prayer, at least be neutral, mm. but never be unkind. Yeah. I don't concern myself too much with what's going on in the world. I concern myself only with what the spirit asks me to do. And the spirit only, only leads me towards construction, towards love. It is a gentle, non-combative spirit, overwhelms with love. So I become a divine or a cosmic postman. I deliver letters. It's none of my business what's in those letters. If I deliver the letter of inspiration to you, I don't know where that will take you. I did, but it's not my, that, that's not my responsibility. I don't try to work that out. I just listen to spirit. And, and to listen to spirit, the more um, obscurations I'm able to remove, the more I'm able to hear the small, still voice who directs me through my intuition. And when he speaks, I know that I'm certain it's him. I'm absolutely certain. I feel that there's a clarity to it. If I'm not certain, then I'll find stillness in my meditation until I become certain. And then once I'm certain, I act. And then it's, in, it's imperative that I do act. Yeah. Because he infuses me with the spirit that I need to deliver. And if I don't deliver, it becomes pestilent. It curdles, and then that blocks the flow of light again, and then that becomes another negative filter for spirit, and it attracts, as we know, when we think negatively, it attracts beast and fowl. It means our atmosphere has been stolen, and it starts to um, entangle with other atmospheres. Mm -hmm. So all of the work, all of the work, all of the work is just on the self. As it says in the Gita, lift the self by the self. Never let the self droop down. The self is the self's only enemy. The self is the self's only friend. So we, we need to become a unified being. Yeah. So if there's any parts of my body, if there's any parts of my thinking, if there's any parts of my life that I haven't won control back over, I'm not a unified being. Yeah. And then it doesn't matter how much spiritual practice I do, Julian, it's just going to be an aberration. It's just going to stick on the side. And it's going to get flushed off the first time there's any kind of crisis or storm. So for the um, for the for the spiritual practice to stick, we need to do the work. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to my mom yesterday, um, and uh, she didn't realise she was telling me a great spiritual secret. She, my mom was a cleaner all her life, a, a cleaner in the school, and. You wouldn't think that's a spiritual practice, but she told me something yesterday that was more profound than stuff I've read from some of the deepest esoteric books I've ever read. She said, when I was in the school, I was a clean cleaner. She said, but one of the ladies I had was a dirty cleaner. She said she would go in and she would try and buffer the floor and polish it when it was still dirty. And it looked on the surface like it might be clean, but everybody really knew it was filthy because she just scattered the dust and the and the litter under the tables and under the, you know, under the desks. So she said, to be a clean cleaner, she said, you need to pick up the litter, get rid of the rubbish first. Then you need to dust, brush, get rid of all the dust. Then you need to wash the floor. Then she said, the polish will take and it will gleam. Anything other than that is a dirty cleaner. So we get people... This is not a judgment because I've done exactly mm. this. I've done all this. I've tried to bypass it. I've tried to hack the system. I've tried to get there quicker, and I've just been a dirty cleaner. I'm just, I've, I've, maybe I've got all the quotes, but I'm not really clean, and they fall away the, as soon as there's a crisis. So to be, um, to be spiritually receptive, we need to get rid of the rubbish in our life. Mm -hmm. You know what that is. I know what it is. People out there know that they know what it is. They know they know where they go when the lights are off and they're on their own. They know where their mind goes and they know where their hands go. So we know where to work. So we need to get rid of the big stuff first, the rubbish. Get the rubbish. Get rid of all the litter and the rubbish. Then we need to sweep clean. Then we need to wash, cleanse. 
then we can receive spirit and it will sit there. It won't, it, it's like the, the parable of um, the wineskin. You don't put new wine into an old wineskin because it will split it and it will spoil the wine. Mm. We need to put new wine into a new wineskin. So we, need, we can't have negative and positive cognition sitting in the same kind of sack. Yeah. We need to clear, clear away one and convert it and then add another. So it's always about the work. <clears throat> and the work is more local than people think. In order to work spiritually, we need to start by working locally. Yeah. So we can be going around all day long saying spiritual things. But if I'm still allowing devils across the threshold when I look at sexual pornography or when I watch violent pornography or when I indulge in, you know, all the negative stuff, that's all the subjective stuff that's on the news every single day. Mm. When I still believe in the, in the, you know, that some people should be harmed or that I should seek witness revenge um, or that forgiveness is weak. When I'm still having those kind of thoughts, I'm not a clean vessel. Yeah. Now, the cleaning is done by piecemeal. It's not like we have to clean all in one go. And it's not like you can't work if you're in the process. If You, you know, I, I did a lot of very good things while I was still cleaning. But my degree of spiritual power that came through me only increased as I decreased my, my, my ego. Mm. So every time I decreased my ego and got rid of a bad habit, my consciousness expanded and I was able to be a better transmitter for light. And as you said, leave light in the world. Um, and each time I did that and my consciousness expanded, it enabled me to see another thing that I needed to clean on. Mm -hmm. So what the Buddhists say, the Buddhists say, uh, first gather your energy in. Your, your energy is scattered into the 10,000 things. It's lent out. It's mortgaged out to 10,000 things. That's why people are ineffective. That's why they can't break through the stratosphere of perception to the place beyond perception because they haven't got enough energy so to <clears throat> so gather your energy back in by cleaning <clears throat> clean yourself up once you've got your energy back concentrate your energy on what reality is and reality will speak to you and say if you'd like to serve i can show you where to serve so then we become Rumi's water wheel we bring the water in and we give it away weeping we don't want to give it away because it's God, it's, we feel God in us. <clears throat> but in order for it to perpetuate, we need to continually keep giving it so away. So it keeps flowing. Yeah. Keeps flowing. So we receive it and we give it away. So we, we uh, Rumi says we receive the water on the wheel and we give it away weeping. I love mm. that. He said that's the only way we can stay in the garden. The moment we hold on to the water, the moment we think it's ours, the moment we start to discriminate between who we think we should give it and who we should think shouldn't have yeah. it, we stop the flow of the water and we're no longer in the garden. So I don't make any decisions about who has the light that God gives mm. me. I don't make any decisions. I don't know what to do. I genuinely don't. It, the, it is, it's unfathomable. But the spirit does know. The spirit guides me. It goes before me. As a vanguard, it stays behind me as a rear guard. It surrounds me um, like a posse and it directs it's, me. It's, it says, give this person an hour, give this person five minutes. Don't give this person anything because they're not ready for it yet. And if they say, if it says to me, give this person an hour and I give them 55 minutes, I haven't given enough. Five minutes of that spirit is going gonna, is gonna to spoil and become pestilent and it's going to be lost. Mm. If it says to me, give an hour and I give an hour and 30, I've given beyond the capacity and that's where we become, if we're not careful, we can become spiritually burnt mm -hmm. out because we give, we, when I first woke up, I wanted to give everything to everybody. And I thought I knew, yeah. I thought I knew who should have it. I've got to give it to everybody. Mm -hmm. And as much as they want, I ended up absolutely wrecked, Same here. burned out. And the spirit saying to me, listen to me, listen to me. I'll tell you who to give to, when to give, how much to give. I'll tell you when to start and when to stop, but you need to listen to me. Because obviously once we get the spirit in us, we feel high. Yeah. So we just think I'm going to give it to everybody, even if they don't want it. They need it, but they yeah. don't. The spirit knows who needs it. We can't work that out. So I just become a postman. I'm the cosmic postman. Um, and because I love God and because I, 
I love this feeling of service. I want to be a cleaner vessel. I want to, I want to hear the voice clearer. Mm -hmm. So that means I'm in constant prayer every day. So when I wake up in the morning and all through the day, and then when I go to bed at night, I'm talking to God. We're talking now, mm -hmm. and between us, we're talking to God because we're here for the same reason. We want to spread light into the world. So it's always about contracting in order to expand. Mm -hmm. When we contract, we expand. As we expand, we see we are able to see clearer and we're able to contract more. Mm -hmm. So we keep contracting. They call this spiritual kenosis, self-emptying. So we empty the ego <clears throat> so that the spirit can fill mm -hmm. us. Then the spirit starts to rise and descend and it covers, it coats the soul and the soul becomes Christed. So it means the soul is magnified. Mm -hmm. It means the soul is a bigger battery. It's got a stronger broad broadband, a stronger bandwidth. It's able to receive more spirit. And it's able to impose more spirit. But like the water wheel, we've got to keep moving. And if, the, if we suddenly think, oh, it wants me to go here today. It wants me to speak to him today. And I don't feel like going there. You know, we've got to learn to listen to the spirit. Either we're in it or we're not. Mm -hmm. You know, if it says go here and do this, then we go and do that. But everything I've received, everything I've received from the spirit has always been about contracting the self and working in kindness. Anything that's not kind, I know doesn't come from the yeah. spirit. Anything that's not gentle, that hasn't got an ultimate aim of love. You know, if there's anything to dissolve, it's in me. Yeah. You know, so anything out there is just a mirror. So when I look out now, I look out my window, my mirror is very beautiful. My mirror is only very beautiful. Not, it's not beautiful because I've changed locations, Julian. It's beautiful because I've changed perceptions. Mm. And I go to the place beyond perception and I bring this light or this, um, the attractive forces, as Ushiba would call it, or, you know, the philosopher's stone, the holy grail, bring it down, it coats me, and then I am a better receptor. But I don't, I don't choose who I speak to and who I don't speak to. My intuition, my inner tutor, mm. this is what the Old Testament says, the soul will teach you. Your own soul will teach you. <laughs> the, the soul that just wakes up hasn't got the power to do that. It's assailed. There's so many dark forces around it. So as it, as it starts to wake up and, and work and win autonomy over its territories, it wins control, wins self-control. It learns to manage its own uh, sympathetic nervous system so it's not scattered by fear. It's not scattered by anger or lust or any of those vices. Once it's able to sit in the center, in the arc, in the eye wall, you become noticed and the spirit starts to give you more and coat more and then you expand again and then it coats you more then you expand again and it'll say you've still got this to work on you're still flirting with girls or you're still you know you're still you're still losing your atmosphere to a bare ankle you're still losing your atmosphere to judgment we've got to keep our atmosphere as Gurdjieff says in our atmosphere here right here in our center our attention stays here and if we're distracted by something they say on the news and we're scattered, we've lost our atmosphere to what Boris Johnson just said. Bring the atmosphere back. I don't need to listen to Boris Johnson. I don't need to listen to a politician or a banker. I don't need to listen. I need to listen to my spirit. Mm. My spirit's working beyond all that. I don't need to judge them either. Mm. Everybody's unfolding in their own way at their own time. All I do is listen to spirit. Where do you want me? Um, and I'm afraid of that. Of course I am. You know, that's healthy. I'm afraid of it. Well, there's only one legitimate fear, and that's the fear of being separated from God. And that's the beginning of wisdom, <clears throat> as they say in Judaism. So I, my fear, the same as the fear of Christ, the same as the fear of Muhammad, the same as the fear of Arjuna Pandava, mm. is that he's going to ask me to do too much. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid that I won't be up to it, mm. but, but he only gives me what I can cope with, and I want to serve. I want to do that, but it's not me who decides. Yeah. I don't decide who I go and have a coffee with. I don't decide who I do a podcast with. I don't decide. I feel it in me. 
just says, this person needs this. Jeff doesn't even question it anymore. Mm. Um, it, sorry, this, did you see? Oh, it's just gone. It just said this. Uh, I'm not sure. There's connection issues, but it's okay. Okay. Is that okay now? We'll, we'll carry on anyway, but it's still filming. Okay. Um, yeah, you're a little bit delayed, but. Okay, hopefully, hopefully that it that it fixes up. Um, yeah. So it's so it's really about you know like exactly as you said that you basically summed it all up at the beginning. Mm. But it's not about knowing that, Julian. It's about living that. Yeah. We've got to live it. I used to say to people, I used to have quite a few people, um, and quite a few uh, critics in my early time as a martial arts instructor, and I said, "So listen, when I go home at night." And I'm alone in the dark. I know who I am. Mm. I know what my thoughts are. I know where they're wrong and I know where they're right. And I'm talking to God all the time. I'm not perfect, but I'm congruent. I'm congruent because I know I'm not perfect. I'm congruent and I'm humble because I know I'm weak. I absolutely know I'm weak. Mm. I've been in the, I've been in, in this I've been in this uh, communication with God and it's put me on my knees at times because I've been so afraid of it. Mm. So I know I'm weak. And, and because I'm weak, Christ is able to form perfectly in that weakness, mm. to paraphrase St. Paul. So it's always just working on the self. And that's a good thing, but it's also difficult. It's a good thing because it's like, well, I haven't got to worry about the 10,000 things. I just worry about uh, my concern is to get my body as aligned as possible so I can hear the spirit and then I can take his directions. The hard thing about that is I can't blame anybody anymore. It's not my mum's fault or my teacher's fault or my abuser's fault if I'm not living congruently, if I'm not living in accordance with wisdom and love. It's nobody's fault but mine. Mm -hmm. So my job is not to concern myself with that guy over there who's doing that wrong or that person over there who's not congruent. My job is to look at myself and be as pure and as full of love and as honest as I can be. And most of that has come for me through um, you know, being shown where I need to work, confessing where I'm wrong. Like if you look at um, uh, Notes from a Factory Floor, that I wrote, it's a book, a memoir. Notes from a Factory Floor is my confession. It's me saying, listen, some of you people who've read Watch My Back think I'm Robin Hood, mm. but I'm not. I was a violent, unkind, um, ugly person. I don't like to use the word, but I was ugly. I was an unkind person. I was having affairs. I was extremely violent. I was very insecure. Um, there was lots of things I was doing right. I was, I was, there was a lot of kindness there mm. and I felt like I was doing the right thing, but believe me. So my, my first act of contraction there was to confess all the things and say, this is, you think that I'm, this is what I am, but this is what I really mm. am. And that's how I cleaned it. So I gave it over. I, I owned it. I gave it over. And then God cleaned it for me. And I was able to contract. As I contracted, my consciousness expanded. The day, the, literally, literally, the day I finished writing notes, which was a confessionary book, which is the beginning of repentance. We, we repent or we return to love when we stop doing the wrong things and we confess the wrong things. And then we start doing the right yeah. things. The moment, the day I finished that on the Friday, 20 chapter ideas fell into my mind like coins falling through water for the divine CEO. On the Monday, I sat down to write the divine CEO and it came through me like a, like a cosmic channeling. Download. Yeah. You channeled yeah. It came well. to me. I wrote it. People said to me, that's a wonderful book. I said, yeah, no, I, I didn't write it. I didn't know it. But that was the gift because I'd contracted during mm. My mind expanded and I was able to receive that. But I only received it for one reason, in order to share yeah. it, in order to pass it on. Okay. Tell you what, Jov. In, in Gnosticism, Kabbalah, Sufism, and many other mystical practice, uh, the five plane of existence, the five planes of existence are being spoken about. The spiritual, yeah. the mental, the emotional, the physical, even the sexual plane. All these planes are interconnected. Ideas are born in the mind, but the energy that gave birth to the idea 
in the first place was created in the spiritual realm, then transmuted at the level of the mind. Then the idea in the mind gives birth to an emotion in the body, as emotions are energy in motion. The emotion gives birth to a feeling, and that feeling gives birth to a word or action. Now, whether or not the initial idea is fueled by light or darkness determines our words or actions if they reflect love or fear. So my question is, how do we place our self-awareness onto the higher planes so that we can transmute the energy at the level of the spirits or the mind so that we are not surprised by the result of our words and actions? Just by what we said, by cleaning, mm -hmm. cleaning, pick up the pick up the rubbish, pick up the big stuff. We know what the big stuff is. You know, people overeat, they overdrink. They don't stop thinking. They don't stop speaking. They don't think about what they're speaking. They don't realize that they don't know the law. So get the body right. First of all, win the body back. Win, make the body clean. Stop being distracted. If people think they're strong, but they're getting tapped out by cigarettes 30 times a day, they think they're strong, but they're getting tapped out by a Mars bar, mm. you know, or they're getting tapped out by a second pudding, or they're getting tapped out by, uh, by alcohol or they're getting tapped out by something as small as gossip. But in Judaism, if you're going to go into the minutiae, Judaism, they consider gossip to be murder because you're assassinated spirit. You're, you're killing spirit at the, at the level of spirit. Mm -hmm. They consider shaming somebody. Uh, they consider that to be drawing blood because you're drawing blood up the body into the face and they flush. Yeah. So they're saying what you do, everything you do affects Everything, everything affects everything. So if you drop a pebble in the corner of a pool, the ripples will be met everywhere. Now, that's good if those ripples are good. Yeah. If you're working from kindness and working from spirit, that's good. But if you're working from a place of unkindness, every pebble you drop in the pool is going to have a negative effect. <clears throat> so it's about coming back to the self, working on the self, and expanding consciousness. So Gurdjieff talks about the three the three brain being. So he basically says we've got the three bodies. It kind of works out to be five, but we've got the three bodies, uh, like the physical, uh, the subtle, and we've got the causal or the, or the mm -hmm. soul. And he said they all feed off different things. So the, the, the physical body feeds off food, uh, you know, the foods we take in every day. The subtle bodies are fed um, uh, by the permeation of breath mm -hmm. or prana that we take in every single yeah. day. This is why we practice pranayama, yoga, qigong, tai chi, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and the highest body you're talking about, the soul, is coated with, with uh, light directly from mm -hmm. God. Yeah. But in order to get the light directly from God and not come to a negative filter, we first make, need to make sure that the physical body is, is taking in the least amount of food it needs and the best food it can get in order to make it a clean vessel. So my body doesn't take in anything dead. Mm -hmm. I have nothing, you know, as in animals, flesh. I kept my protein and my light directly from vegetables. This has been my personal instruction. Yeah. So it said to me, you need a higher level fuel. You want to go through perceptions to God. We need to, we need to not um, uh, um, alter the, the karma of animals by stealing their bodies. We need to get our, get our light or get our energy for the food body from plants, from, um, from vegetables, you know, from the normal stuff that we all know. The breath, most people are in a constant state of suspended anxiety mm -hmm. because the news, the newspapers, the information coming in, that's food. Yeah. It's food. It goes in and it forms as flesh. So we're taking an anxiety every day. Every single day we're being told there is this illness, there's this virus. It starts off one in five of you will get cancer. Now if you look at the television, one in two of us will get cancer. It won't be long before they're saying everybody's going to get cancer. Mm. That's negative, subjective information, fear information that's coming in all the time. Yeah. Um, you're looking at the things now, it's, if it's not – we're not going to get enough fuel. We're not going to get enough food. You know, the mortgages are going up. Interest rates are expanding. Putin's over there killing everybody. There is fear, fear, fear coming at us every day. So I don't take that food. Me. 
I don't accept that food. So I just make sure that all the food that comes into my body, Julian, is like this food. We're share, we're we're feeding now. This is spiritual manner. Yeah. It's not coming from me and it's not coming from you. It's coming from God and it's coming through us. So in order for us to attract, you're asking how do we attract that highest level? First of all, we need to prepare the lower level. Of <clears throat> so it's all the same thing. It's all spirit, but they're just different concentrations. So the prana we get through food or the chi or the spirit we get through food is a lower density, a lower concentration. And then the breath, it's a higher concentration for the higher body, but the highest body comes from God. So in order for us to be um, uh, a clean channel, so there's no blocks in it, we need to make sure the food body, the breath body, this includes the mind and the intellect, the subtle bodies are clean and aligned. A bit like, um, a bit like uh, the pipes in, you know, in your plumbing. If the pipes are blocked, the same as the, your veins. If the veins are blocked, it causes illness. It means that the energy can't flow. So we've got to get ourselves back, to, back into a flowing condition. And that's going to come by getting the food right, by getting um, uh, the breath right. And that's through dedicated discipline practice. Yeah. And then once we start to do that, once we become unified in our body, <clears throat> we automatically start connecting to spirit. Uh, once we create a vacuum, we automatically start to attract spirit. So the moment we create a vacuum that, uh, by removing or converting a negative, we'll automatically start to attract light. Mm. The danger with it, not the danger, it's a gift and it's a joy, but the danger with attracting light is that once we've attracted it, we can't hold it. We're not, we're in, we haven't got the body to hold mm. it. We direct it. So this is what they call directional light. Um, if you've looked at a light bulb, for instance, mm -hmm. a light bulb creates uh, light by uh, putting energy through a, uh, through a filament and it creates incandescent light. Mm -hmm. So we know that works. The danger with that is that 90% of the light is lost because it's not directional. It's scattered. It's random. Mm -hmm. So it goes everywhere at the same time. So light bulbs burn out quite quickly because there's too much heat. There's lots of things in a light bulb to protect it from overheating. But basically, it's a scattered light. It's not directional. If you look at an LED yeah. light, an LED light, it go, the, the, the voltage goes through a chip and it's directional. So 90% of it is light and it only loses 10% the heat. So that's what we need to become spiritually. So we need to become, we need to bring the energy in and release it in a directional manner. That means that, that we have to listen to the spirit. The spirit will say, put the light here, put the light there. I was probably the same as you at the beginning. I was incandescent. I'd give my light to everybody mm. and just kept burning out. And I just thought it was it needed to be with everybody. And I wasted most of it. So now it says to me, it's exact, really exact. It says, give sometimes it will say, give this person five minutes. That's all they can take at the moment. Anything else, excuse me, will be wasted. Sometimes it might say, give this person an hour. That's what, that's what his viewers or that's what he can receive at the moment. But it might say spend five days with this person or, or, or correspond with this person for five days. And you'll know, you'll feel it. This person is no longer receiving the light. He's just trying to drink. Yeah. He's trying to vampire. Energy vampirism, yeah. Yeah. So and then it might say you need to walk with this person for the next five years. And you'll feel it. It's so strong. So that's what we call directional light. Mm -hmm. So that God's bringing in and he's saying to us exactly to the second. You give it and then you switch off and then you move on. You're a postman. I don't, I've got a lot of letters to post. I don't post a letter to you and wait for you to open it and see what's mm. in it and, and try to discern what it means. I post a letter to you and I forget and then I move on and I post a letter to somebody else. self we post so many letters, we don't even know who we've posted them to. I often get stuff from people saying, you, you wrote to me 15 years ago and it did this for me and, uh, and I, don't, I don't remember. I don't remember because I do it so much because mm -hmm. the Spirit is saying to me, send this, write to him, write to them. 
sometimes it says no, this person, it's not because I'm judging them, it's saying this person's not ready. Mm. This light at the moment will be wasted on them. It will, it will land on, on stony ground. So in order to receive the highest light, we need to contract. Mm. We need to get the food body right. We need to get the subtle body right. Um, we need to, then once we get the food body and the subtle body right, then the, the higher body automatically starts to uh, scatter this divine tinctures of light. What they call in in, in, in Judaism, they call them, in Kabbalah, they call it hokma, mm -hmm. wisdom sparks. So we need to receive this light. We need to conserve this light. We need to train this light sometimes. And then we need to impose it into the world where we direct it. Now, it's no good me receiving more light if, if I'm a bucket with 20 holes in it. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I need to fill all the I need to be hermetically sealed. Imagine a light bulb. A light bulb, the, way, the reason a light bulb works is, is because the light bulb is, is encased in glass. Mm -hmm. It's a vacuum. It's, it's hermetically sealed so that uh, if, it, if it wasn't hermetically sealed and if it hadn't got inert gas inside the bulb, the filament would burn out very quickly. Mm. If there's a crack in the glass, it's not like the oxygen outside says, oh, there's a crack in the glass, let's enter. It's pressing against the glass tube mm. and it just enters. And the moment, the moment it enters from the outside, the moment our hermetic seal is breached, the filament burns out. Now, in, it, as a simile, the, the filament is the soul. The soul is what, if you imagine a light bulb, uh, positive terminal, negative terminal, yeah. we place the filament between the two and it creates light. The filament burns. Yeah. So with us, we place our, dark, our, bright and our, our good energy and our dark energy, we, we connect them with the filament of the soul or with our will force and it creates light. But we need to be hermetically sealed. Otherwise, that light is going to seep out and we're just going to burn out. So to be hermetically sealed means that we haven't got vices. Yeah. We have control of the thoughts. It also means that the filament, exactly what you said at the beginning, the filament has to be tempered. You don't just put a piece of metal between those two powerful forces. You don't just receive this light and think it, you know, it's romantic and we give it out. You have to be tempered. This is what Christ called the bitter cup. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to drink from the same bitter cup as me? This is the 12 stations of the cross. This is how the soul prepares in, to be able to act as a floating bridge between the two powerful forces. Mm. So that the two powerful forces are created into a bridge that automatically enables you to harvest light. When we harvest light, we bring it into the body. So we receive it, we conserve it, we train it, we impose it. We put it, we might impose it through sound, like mm -hmm. I'm doing now, or through breath, like I'm mm -hmm. doing now. Might do it through mudras. You notice I use a lot of mudras. So we do it might do it through mudras. This might not mean anything, but somebody will feel it at some mm -hmm. level. Same as we do on the doors. We use mudras, don't we? We use body language. So We've got to be hermetically sealed. It's no good trying to bring in more yeah. light if we're not hermetically sealed. And if we're not hermetically sealed, unless the ego is subjugated, mm -hmm. completely, com completely converted into light. And we can only do that if we know ourselves. And we can only know ourselves if we're brave enough to look in the mirror and see what we really mm. see. When I got my fifth down, I don't know, 20 years ago, it was a master grade. I remember feeling... Uh, proud of myself and thinking, you know, I've got this fifth down. I looked in the mirror and my consciousness expanded when I got my fifth down. But it was saying to me, you've got this fifth down not just because of what you've done, but because of what you're expected to do next. So I, my consciousness expanded. I looked in the mirror. I saw a fat, overweight, porn-addicted, unkind, violent man, insecure. It was a shock. Do you mm. I was a fifth down. It was all I could do was have a fight and I've got a strong will, but my will was, was incandescent. It was scattered everywhere. I was doing 10,000 things at once. Yeah. So it said, you, if you want to be a master, you need to master this. I automatically recognized I wanted to change the world, but 
but I couldn't change my own waist measurement. I couldn't, I couldn't win an argument with, with a piece of innate food. Mm. I had no control of my inner self. I could control adrenaline and I could stand in fear <clears throat> and, I could, and I could hold myself in violent situations, but I couldn't resist food. I couldn't resist sex. I'd got no control of what Gurdjieff calls the sex center, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, I've got no control of that. I've got control of it in some areas, but not completely. So there was a lot of territories that I hadn't got control mm -hmm. over. So the moment I saw them, I contracted. So you look at me now, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know what I am about, probably about 11 stone. I was 16 mm -hmm. stone. Um, and I had this massive energy, and I could kill in 30 languages, and I was skilled in all these martial arts, but my energy wasn't directional. And God was saying to me, do you want to go to another level? Do you want to reach another level? Mm. Let's have a look at what this is really about. Let's stop you to stop trying to be ambitious and sit in this animal realm and create what you think you need to create. Let me tell you, let me tell you as your divine sat nav where to go, when to move left, when to move right, when to move forward, when to move back. So I, I went from being an incandescent vessel of energy scattering it everywhere mm. throwing my seeds on tarmac and wondering why they're not taking to be in a directional force of light so that means if you're a directional force of light and this is the ambition you can sit in a room and be centered and the whole city can be affected by you mm. the whole city can be affected the cafe you're in will be will become more propitious will will make more money the people in the cafe will be more ambitious will be more inspired even if they don't know you just by you sitting there and that's not the energy you. yeah there's the light coming yeah. through you and you can't own that either you don't you're not proud of it you just go oh that's what's happening i want to do this more because obviously if i'm processing the light it's going to come through me it's going to cope me so everything i give out i get to own as well i bring it in mm -hmm. i conserve it i train it and I impose it. So, of course, I'm coated in it. So I feel that joy of God every time I talk. Mm. So we can ultimately, if we can sit in a room and be centered, someone like Sri Aurobindo um, would sit in a room in his ashram in Pondicherry, and they said there was a hurricane outside, and everything was blowing down, and his room was untouched. Nothing shifted. Nothing moved. His, his center was so strong. Mm. So the center is where the will force sits in the Dantian, in the tummy. But to do that, you know, this all sounds really lovely and exciting, but to do that, we have to contract. We have to go to war with this battle with food. Yeah. That's the first thing. We have to go to war with this battle with alcohol, this battle with drugs, with this battle with uh, uh, the, the drugs of gossip, the drugs of, um, you know, um, conspiracy everybody's mad on conspiracy but where does it take your attention julian out there mm. if there's a conspiracy it's in mm. here the illuminati everybody's scattered looking for the illuminati you are the illuminati we're the illuminati the moment we are able to center ourselves and bring that light into us we illuminate yeah so we don't need to be distracted by the clickbait of the ten thousand things we need to come back and center ourselves. If you really want to work, mm. then we need to get these three centers controlled or these five bodies, however you want to look okay. at it. So I need to have control of my food body. I need to have control of my breath body. Mm. That means discipline. I need to have control of my mind and intellect. We know what that means. It means study. Mm -hmm. It means studying things that are difficult. It means pain. As Aeschylus says, the philosopher Aeschylus, those who learn must suffer mm. but learning is very very uncomfortable because you suddenly see things and it can be overwhelming yeah. you're receiving light and it can be overwhelming if you haven't got control of your endocrine system if you haven't got control of that and most of that's going to come through the food so people like you because you you work the doors don't I you? still do yeah so people like you um and people like me we're recruited into this because we know how to handle fear we know how to control our bodies in times of fear. So we are noticed by these higher spirits. This is a great candidate to receive spirit without spoiling it, mm. without, you know, without uh, 
splashing it everywhere in 10 directions. I don't want to receive spirit from God and empty two thirds of it into a tissue watching pornography on the internet. Mm. I don't want to, I don't want to receive spirit and spoil it by overeating or over drinking. I don't want to sit outside Costa and gossip about people and use my spirit there. I want my spirit to come in and I want it to be delivered in this manner. Yeah. People like you and your audience. This is a good use of spirit because it's saying you have the potential. Everybody has the potential. That's what Christ yeah. said. All these things I'm doing, you can do and more. Because people go, oh, well, that's Jesus and that's different. It's not. He's saying you can do this and mm -hmm. more. But to do that, he says, this is how you do it. First of all, you understand the fixed laws, causation. Yeah. Don't think anything. Don't say anything. Don't do anything that you don't want to see again. It's all, all the things you are talking about is also hermeticism. Uh, something that, that yeah. I really, really enjoyed reading was the Kaibalion, uh, the seven hermetic principles. And uh, yeah. you spoke about the philosopher's stone. And it's, it's interesting because this is the symbol uh, that I chose for my logo. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, because I was fascinated with its magical powers. For many men during the ages, the Philosopher's Stone was a magical object, granting them the power to transmute base metal into gold. Now, yeah. if you look at quantum physics, we realize that we live in a magical universe where everything is possible. And when transmutation is actually a science. So I can truly feel in the depth of my heart that science and magic are two sides of the same coin. Now, from the perspective of the higher planes in terms of spiritual, mental and emotional alchemy, the Philosopher's Stone is a state of consciousness that can transmute energy at will. And to me, it is the power of the word, the frequency and vibration of the incantation, uh, the state of consciousness where we absolutely believe anything that we say to ourselves. And we therefore can say to the mountain to move and the mountain shall move. Have you ever reached this state of consciousness and have you ever managed to maintain it so that you can access it at will? And if you did, how, how did you do that? Yeah, I mean, that's what I do. That's how I live. Yeah. I'm contracting all the time and I'm expanding. So everything I do, every single thing I do is a miracle. I'm having miracles happening all the time. Mm. I've had so many miracles happen that um, that I, I've, I, I try to write them all down because I forget them. There's so many, yeah. um, and it's the same thing. In order to in order to access that highest level of uh, the philosopher's stone or the tinctures of wisdom or whatever you want to call it, you have to first be unified. The unified being, we have to be aligned. So there's a danger that we can get too caught up in the intellectual understanding of that and not do the work because the work is the day-to-day -day work on um, being congruent, living kindly and killing our own ambition. Even our own, even our ambition to, you know, understand God more, just do the work, sit in the center and expect nothing. And then it will start to come. So at the beginning, these miracles are like what Richard Rose would call a happy accidents. They tend to just happen. We don't know how yeah. they happen. So we just do all the things we can do to make ourselves accident prone. So they happen more. When you get to a higher level, you are able to call it down at will as long as you've got a strong purpose. My purpose is I want to receive this. Like, for instance, this is the book we were talking about, 99 Reasons to mm. Forgive. That's an example of, I said to, said to God, I'm trying to explain forgiveness to people, the metaphysical power you know, the divine attribute in the power of forgiveness, but I can't articulate mm -hmm. it. And I'm not convincing people. I don't feel like I'm helping them. Can you guide me? So that book, within a week, that book downloaded into my head, the whole book, <clears throat> but not just the book, but 110 hours of Judaic um, lecture by a rabbi in America on specifically from the book, a book called the Tanya, which is one of the commentaries on the Kabbalah or the Old Testament, or specifically Kabbalah, from the Zohar, the Tanya. So it's a, 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 a massive commentary on, um, you know, on, the, on spirituality or particularly on the, on the Torah. So 
I, I asked for guidance and I suddenly was given all of this information which I had to take in. So that was all of that was a miracle. That was information downloaded into me. This is a great book, but I didn't write it. Mm. This, is a, this is a profound book and it offers a, a new denotation to what forgiveness is. It's a, and I didn't, I didn't write it. It just came through me. But I had to have the discipline to sit there and go through the discomfort because obviously when this energy came through me julian it pulled up loads of old sins from me that i didn't know were mm. there loads of areas that i needed to clean this energy comes through you it picks up any detritus yeah. and i had to process that so it's very painful sitting and you know listening to 110 hours of lecture it takes a massive discipline and it's not just that you're taking it in it, believe me when i was studying that and when I was studying the Zohar, mm. I would, he'd say to me, I want you to read this now for five hours a day. If I read for five hours and 15 minutes, I felt so overwhelmed, I thought I might go mad. Mm. I felt absolutely overwhelmed. It was like putting a 1,000 watts to a 100-watt ball. Yeah. So when it said to me, study for five hours, it meant five hours, not five hours and five minutes. And if I studied for four hours instead of five, I didn't feel, I had the same feeling of, of I, I hadn't downloaded it. Yeah. This spirit that I was given to download has been vouchsafed for me. And if I don't crystallize it, it's going to perish. It's, it's a living, sentient spirit. So it's saying, if we give you five hours, please take five hours. Don't think you can scoot it and just do four hours and 30. Yeah. And if we say five hours, don't, don't do five hours and 15 because we're doing five hours because we know that's the maximum we can stretch out that's the most you can cope with then you need to go away then you need to do your yoga and your pranayama and fill yourself with spirit again and that and that will um, immunize you to the effects of this yeah. light that's coming in so everything i do th this is another example this is a book called it's a stage play called fragile now, before I can get something like this, I have to do something like this. Mm. This is a play I wrote about my own life. Okay. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's basically an exorcism. This was me individuating the darkest secrets and the, uh, the worst detritus, the devils and the parasites that were living in me. I was abused when I was 11. The abuser left a parasite mm. in me and it grew over the years. And this was how I part of the way I got him out because mm -hmm. all of these things in my head, all of these, this parasite was talking to me and saying, if people knew what a deviant you were, if people knew how dirty you were, if people knew how disgusting you were, if people knew what you did when you were alone in the dark, they would abandon you. You know, they would be ashamed of you. You'd lose your wife. You'd lose your kids. You'd lose your agent. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I had to clean that out. So I wrote a play and I put it in front of an audience and I was terrified of doing it. Um, and an audience over three weeks in a, in a theatre and then over the next few years, because it travelled internationally, audiences sat with me and watched this play and helped me to clean this parasite out of my mm -hmm. body. That's a, that is a, a living, practical form of individuation. And the only reason I was able to do that was because I'd been a bouncer and I understood fear and I knew how to sit in fear sometimes for months at a time. I knew how to have somebody threatening to kill me mm. and live with that, wake up with it in my breakfast, find it in my sex, mm. you know, have it, have that fear of someone wanting to kill me when I'm with my children, yeah. when I'm training. So I knew how to handle fear. So I wrote it and everything inside me was saying to me, you're going to be ashamed. People will hate you and, they're going to see what a deviant you are. When I put that onto the stage, people were crying. People were hugging me. People were embracing me. It was the opposite to what this parasite threatened. They actually had the, the Samaritans at the door every night yeah. because the play was so full of truth. So that was when I, when I cleaned that out, I, I, I converted that darkness into light. It contained light. Yeah. I converted it into light. It, it held my autonomy. It sat on my causal body, in my dantian, in my mm -hmm. stomach. It sat there. 
So I won my, my autonomy back. I expanded exponentially. And that enabled me to do the next film, the next play, the, the next piece of cleaning. Mm. So for every good, for every difficulty, I was given one good. This is what the lovely line in the Quran. For every difficulty, I will give you one good. For every difficulty, I will give you one good. It says it twice. Mm. It's going to be difficult. But every time you overcome that, I'm going to expand your consciousness. And then I'm going to give you a difficulty. And then I'm going to expand your consciousness because you're going to convert that difficulty. That difficulty contains light. That depression, it contains light. That addiction, it contains light. That fear contains light. That dissonance, confusion contains light. When you absorb that 99% of that, the nature of that fear will be liberated and the light, the effulgence will come across to you and you will expand and you will not see the world in the same way again. And I'm going to give you light. Have a guess what? You're a water wheel. Mm. And I'm going to give you that light and you're going to absorb yourself in it. But you've got to keep giving it away and you've got to give it away weeping. So the whole process of metaphysical practice is no romance. It is very difficult. It's a bitter cup. I love it. I live my life by it. But people have an idea that it's just about collecting quotes or that it's mm. just about, you know, having an intellectual understanding. But as Madame de Salzman says, Gurdjieff's chief instructor, are you doing the work? Are you mm. doing the work? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but are you doing mm. the work? And it says that to me all the time. Yeah, but Jeff, are you doing the work? But I, I, I am obviously doing the work. I get up early. I meditate. I, I you know. It's, um, well, you know yourself, you're in it. You're a huge intellect. I'm very inspired by you. Um, and, and you work the doors. So you are, you know, I know, I know where you're going. I know where God's going to take you. But it's difficult and people shouldn't underestimate it. It's no good collecting these facts if you're still getting battered by food every day. Mm. It's no good collecting these facts if you're still smoking cigarettes and polluting your... Um, your spirit in your body with cigarettes it's no good you know collecting these facts if you're still taking in marijuana or drugs or you know the drug of food or the drug of gossip or the drug of conspiracy mm -hmm. all of it pollutes the mind all of it takes the takes the attack the atmosphere out of your atmosphere and we've got to learn to keep our atmosphere in the center so when you're on the door do you yeah remember? And it's kicking off and it's, you know, it's one of those nights when there's going to be comebacks and there's a lot of fear in the air. You have to contain yourself in your own atmosphere, don't yep. you? And what happens if somebody steals your atmosphere is this chaos. Mm. I've seen people lose the door and never be able to come back again because their atmosphere was stolen by uh, a fear trigger mm. or by a threat. I've seen people leave the door because someone said so-and-so is coming down with a gun and they're gone. Their atmosphere was being stolen. And what we had to learn to do, as the Quakers say, was center down. Sit in the Dantian. Hold your center. Mm. So when you're disciplining yourself to do the work, to do the study, you know, to master the physical body, to master the breath body, that all takes tremendous discipline. To master the mind and the intellect takes tremendous discipline to do the study you've done. And then to control the will. All of those things demand that you stay in the center you hold the center you find the center you stay in the center mm. so it's um you know it's not something i people do flirt with it but you don't get a lot of your flirt if you're recreational you get recreational skills you know if you want to be serious then it needs you know i remember talking to a guy <clears throat> um he come to my class to train with my guys this was many years ago and <clears throat> he was getting tapped out by everybody. And, and he said to me, what am I doing wrong? And I couldn't work it out. And I said, I'm not sure. I said, how often are you training? He said, two, three times a week without fail. Mm. I said, oh, oh, right. I said, these guys are training three times a day. These guys don't work. These got, this is what these guys, this is what they do. They are fully entangled in it. They're fully immersed. Yeah. So he was a recreational player hoping to get professional results. Mm. You don't throw out a weekend script and hope that Hollywood's going to call. So this is about being a serious player. And, and the more you contract and the more you become monastic and, and immerse yourself into that work, the more your, 
the more your ego will contract and the more your consciousness will expand. And then your own soul teaches you. And it might lead you to books and it might lead you to conversations like this. Yeah. If this is a good conversation, all it will do is lead you back to yourself. Yeah. I remember I remember reading Milton, um, Dante Alighieri, you know, some of these great philosophers, Nietzsche, and, and all of them, all of them, I was looking at them and I remember reading Dylan, Bob Dylan's biography and, and he studied all of the Bibles. And I remember thinking, where, you know, where's, where's this knowledge come from? And I realized it was most of it was coming from the Old Testament mm. or from the Bibles. So I thought, well, I'll go to the Bibles. And I opened the Bibles and the Bibles slapped me across the face and said, the answer's in you. Yeah. And all we're going to do is help you to understand what you've experienced yourself. We're going to help you to understand how you can understand. So every single thing I've done has, has brought me closer to myself so that I can connect to God. This is what um, Dogan, the Buddhist, said. Yeah. That, you know that lovely line, whoever reads the Quran writes the Quran. Basically, Do Dogan says you don't only create the Quran, you create the eye that is able to see the Quran and bring all of those prophets to life. Mm. You create the eye that sees it. And as you know, what we what you mentioned at the beginning, the all seeing eye. Yeah. When we create this bridge between opposite forces, you know, by using our will force and you know, we create an opening or an eye. And we're able to see eternity. Yeah. And when that energy comes down, the responsibility is to keep it moving. Okay. You know, you speak about forgiveness, and there's something I wanted to share with you if we still got a bit of time. Yeah. Um, it's a spiritual ancestral healing that I've been through with the help and the, the mighty guidance of the grandfather, San Pedro Cactus, if you know of it. Uh, I've, done, yeah. I've done quite a lot of work with plant medicine and what I'm going to share with yeah. you now is probably one of the most profound work I, I did on myself because I felt like I needed it and it just happened like this. Uh, I, I visualized an infinitely huge round table. My higher self yeah. was sitting at it and on the other side facing my higher self, my shadow self was sitting reluctant to be there, you know. And on one side of the round table, we're sitting all the entities that have brought me so much pain and suffering in my past lives. And I have cursed them as a result of that pain. And on the other side of the round table were all the entities that I have ever been in my past lives, including the present me observing. Uh, once everyone was sat at this round table, uh, the spirit of the cactus Get, you know, guide me through it all and ask me to forgive every single one of those entities for what they did to me in order to lift the curse that I had previously casted uh, upon them. So I told them, whatever you did to me, I forgive you. You know, that I told them that they were free to go and live their lives to the, to the fullest, that their curse was lifted and... So they all eventually, you know, they all stood up and left happy. Uh, and I felt like a massive relief. But that was only half of the that was only half of the ritual that I was about to do. Now, the second part of this, this ancestral healing was to summon all the entities that I have hurt in my past lives. And I know I've done mm. some pretty bad things in my past life. I can feel it because I feel that the karma has followed me in, into this life. And so those that cursed my spirit as a result of, of that, I made their life so difficult. Um, and on the other side of the round table were all the guilty entities I have been in my past life, you know, the cursed entities, basically. Hmm. And the spirit of the cactus uh, guided me through it all, asked me to ask for forgiveness. So I asked for forgiveness. I said that I was truly sorry for my unconsciousness at that stage of my existence. I, I truly repented and I am seeking redemption. Now, as a result of this work, a big number of them have decided to lift their curse. And I felt like one of the 
most massive shift I ever been through. Like a, like a massive weight was lifted from my shoulders. And, and the moral of this work is that sometimes we must forgive, not because others deserve our forgiveness, but because we must forgive uh, in, in order, because we deserve to move on and we deserve to live our life yeah. to the fullest. And so sometimes it's so difficult to forgive people, especially when they've not repented. I, I have no <clears> difficulty <throat> um, forgiving somebody when I truly know that they repented because I can put myself mm. in their place. I've been there. I've done some very bad things that I'm not proud of, but I was unconscious. Mm. It's not, you know, I wasn't conscious. I didn't know any better at that point, but now I do. And by knowing that, I know that I would never do certain things that I did in the past again. Hmm. And so if I deserve forgiveness for what I did, then everyone deserves forgiveness for what they yeah. did. But now the thing is, my, my question is, how do you actually find it in you to forgive those that have not repented, you know? You have mm. to learn, you have to distance yourself from them <clears throat> at some point to avoid getting hurt. But you can't have that rage, that inner rage within you, because that rage prevents you from moving forward. And that's something that I've just recently, Joff, very recently, I got rid of a lot of rage that I had in 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 me. Mm. And I've had a lot. Trust me, I've had a lot of rage in me. Uh, and I thought that I was rid of most of it. And it's true, I've, I, when I had my spiritual awakening in 2012, I, I've got rid of a lot of rage. That's good. But recently, I realized that I still had a lot of rage and I just decided to make peace with the enemy, you know, any enemy that I had in my past and make peace with myself and just realize that this is not who I am anymore, that it's not serving me any longer. Rage yeah. has done something for me led me to this point but right now it's not doing anything more for me and i don't want to be this mean guy that walks everywhere and tries to look mean and don't get me wrong on the door sometimes you have to put that face on it it depends you have to learn to play with that body language not only a reading body mm. language but applying it but i don't want to be that person anymore i just want to be that yeah. person that smiles and be this eccentric julian you know extrovert julian slightly crazy julian but but nice and loving and caring julian that's that's who i want to be yeah your power is in your gentleness yeah this this spirit that we seek is seeking us but it's not a you know it's not a destructive force it's a it's love it's a very gentle force yeah. um so i'll tell you what i've what i've learned what i've been get graced um is you paraphrased Al Ghazali probably without realizing it. He said, I'm afraid not to forgive mm. because I'm afraid of not being forgiven. So we, we are only able to be forgiven to the degree that we can forgive others. The biggest thing that this book has taught me mm. that, uh, that came down is that I don't have the power to forgive. Yeah. It's not a human power. It's a divine attribute. So um, there's a new denotation, a new label for for forgiveness forgiveness means to give it over yeah. it means to give it over to god to give it over to reciprocity to give it over to the the power of equal and opposite returns so it levels its own hills it fills its own valleys it meets it it it, it does its own books we don't need to seek witness revenge or decide whether somebody has shown contrite remorse all we need to do is give it over to a force that knows everything we will never fathom it everybody in the world is responsible for everything that's happening we all we all add a part to the to the the cosmic fat bird if you can if you commit a venal sin something that doesn't seem very big it still contributes to the fat bird so everybody's responsible for everything mm -hmm. once we get that once we understand causation we understand that it doesn't matter what somebody's done, whether they're still doing it or, or whether they're contritely remorseful. That's none of our business. Our business is to recognize that while we hold rage, while we hold anger, while, while we still hold confusion or resentment or the need for revenge, mm -hmm. we are entangled. We are quantumly entangled with them. That means that we cannot be separated from. We're, we're the same. So 
they might we might not see them for 20 years but the person that harmed you or abused you 20 years ago is still abusing you now mm -hmm. he's still sitting on your um causal body and he's still acting as you and through you and when he when that rage rises it's like a umbilical cord between the two of you and you're feeding from each other and then there is a force outside that a dark force you could call it the world pain body or satan yeah. who's feeding through the tentacles of different people so the moment we forgive we we recognize there is a greater force and it will meet this bill yeah it will it will force this person to pick up this bill and I know what's going to come to them. So automatically I have, re I have compassion for them because I think this person doesn't even know this yet. He doesn't even know the basic caus causatory law. So I don't need to concern myself whether, it, with whether or not he's remorseful or contrite. And I don't need to sit on the, the, the belief that I'm in, um, omnip omnipotent. I'm not omnipotent. I don't, I don't know... I, everybody's unfolding at their own rate. I don't know, you know, what's going to happen and what's right for this person, but I know that the spirit does know. So I give it over to God. I just say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to recognize the parasite of rage in me and I am going to no longer engage it. It contains light. Mm. It blocks light. It filters light. And it stops me from, from creating more light because it's holding space where there needs to be a vacuum. Mm. So when I remove it, I convert it into light, it, I expand. Then I'm able to see him in the full light and think this person, if he's doing evil things or he's doing terrible things, it's because he's possessed of, of the same parasite, but I'm not. That's why in Judaism they say, if you see somebody that's harmed you, rush to serve them mm -hmm. because they have something of yours and you need it back. And you have something of theirs. Mm -hmm. They've left a parasite on you. You know it's there because it fills you with rage. So you give them that back and you take your autonomy, you take your autonomy off them and you give it, you give them back their parasite and then you work on healing. So our job is to look at the things we've done wrong. Mm. So when I say I forgive somebody, it means I'm giving you over to causation. Mm. I'm going to let go of the anger. I'm going to let go of the pain. I'm going to let go of the rage. Now that might come to me in a moment of clarity, or it might be something I need to work on over a period of time. Sometimes I've had to go through that process several times to let somebody go. But because I talk to God directly, I'll say, this person's done this. Uh, and I might write it in a book and I go, that's good. You've written that down. Now, now write what you've done. So when I was writing about some of my senior students who betrayed me, I felt lots of anger about their betrayal. And as I wrote it down, God said, that's very good. Put it down on the page. Now write down who you betrayed. And I said, oh, man, I betrayed my first wife. Mm. I betrayed my soul. I betrayed God. I betrayed my children by being a criminal. You know, I betrayed my friend. I can't demand, I can't demand um, loyalty of my own students when I'm not even loyal to my own soul. Mm. I don't need to worry about what they're doing wrong. I need to have compassion for them because I know what they're going to bump into. I know what they're going to see. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be kind. It's not going to be nice. So I need to concentrate on not what they've done wrong and whether they're contritely remorseful. Mm. I'm not, you know, I can't forgive them. I haven't got the power of pardon. But if they're contritely remorseful, God will pardon them. And that's not my job. It's not, my, it's not for me to notice. Mm. My job is to look at my own sin, my own error, my own faults, and find contrite remorse for that. Own it. You know, it's no good me saying, oh, you know, I was, um, I was abused and it made me violent. I, it still happened on my shift. So I have to look at it and go, I was violent. I accept responsibility for that. And whatever the penance is, I'm going to accept it. I'm going to take that. And I just say to God, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to stop doing it immediately. I'm not going to feed it anymore. I'm not going to do it again. And, um, and I want to repent. Repent means to repair, it means to return to a good. Yeah. It means to find refuge, you know, in the very center in the downtown. In order to do that, we have to look at the things we've done wrong. We have to confess them even if it's just directly to mm. God. And then we have to do whatever work we need to do in order to repair that. Mm. So I, a lot of the work I did earlier on when I was talking to kids in prison or going and doing public talks when I was terrified of doing it was, was my repentance. That was my way of cleaning. Mm. That was my, my way of standing in front of other people with no judgment and saying, I've done what you've done. 
and it's um, it's only it's only a blessing that I'm not in the same place as you. But you can change. Yeah, you can change. Your perception put you in here. Your perception, if you change, it can get you out of here. So we don't need to worry about whether they're remorseful or whether that whether they're whether they've repented. Our job is to keep coming back to ourselves. Where are where where are the areas in me that I've not repented? Yeah. You know, to repent means to immediately stop what we're doing. I can't feed it and starve it at the same time. But if I'm still, if I'm saying, like, for instance, a friend of mine said um, um, that he'd had an affair on his wife some years ago and it was killing him. Um, and he was really distraught about it. He was really upset. He said, if she finds out, um, you know, I think it will kill her. I haven't got the heart to tell her. Um, he said, and he was genuinely, genuinely contritely remorseful. He said, it only happened once and I've never done it again. I said, do you watch sexual pornography? And he said, yeah. I said, do you masturbate when you watch sexual pornography? Mm. And I said, yeah. And I said, so you'll still be training your wife every day? And he said, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. I said, when can you stop doing that? And he said, today. So sometimes we think we've, we've stopped doing it, but we're still doing it. We think we're not violent anymore, but we go through violent scenarios in our head. Mm. And we congratulate ourselves on the fact that we haven't, done it behaviorally but we're still going through it in our head so it's still alive we think we've, we think we're not betraying uh our wife but we think of other women when we're having sex with our wife we think of other women when we're masturbating mm. uh, we think we're not betraying our friends but you know we have unkind thoughts about them or we say unkind things about them and we rationalize it by saying well listen he's a nice guy but mm. But if you recorded what you said, you wouldn't want it to go to him. And, you know, so we start to recognize that the wrong thought, unkind thoughts, unkind words, unkind deeds are all acts of murder. They may be, they may, they may feel like they're only small things, but they all add up to the fat burn. Mm -hmm. So if we want to start making a difference in the world. We first have to make a difference in our body. This body needs to be personal clean. It needs to be pristine. Mm -hmm. I need to be putting spirit in and out of it every single day. I need to, there's a lovely saying in the Old Testament, Julian said, the demons can't cross moving rivers. Mm. It basically means if we've got the spirit coming in and moving constantly, these negative forces can't get anywhere near us. They can't sit anywhere near us because they would get swept away by the spirit. So we've got to keep it moving. I don't need to concern myself with what anybody else is doing. I need to listen to the spirit and say, where can I clean more? Who can I serve? Mm. That's inspiring have you have you got time for a last for a last one yes if we let's let's finish at 1 30 is that okay yeah, that's perfect lovely yes so dimensions and angelic realms it is said that dimensions are arranging a harmonic scale design and that there are an infinite number of entities residing in those frequencies light beings and shadow beings you know benevolent beings and mercenaries mainly operating in in the higher or lower unconscious realms of the spiritual mental and emotional body uh, i can remember my first angelic experience uh, it is generally what i refer as my spiritual awakening that was triggered by a novel load of trauma and suffering that accumulated through the first 25 years of my life at that point uh, of life, I was living in Glasgow and I was spending half my nights on park benches looking and talking to the sky and stars. Uh, it is when I started to channel them. I could have easily thought that I was going crazy as I was talking to myself, except that the things I was saying to myself were coming from a group of extremely loving beings that knew me better than I knew myself. And they were not judging me they knew exactly what to say to me to make me feel better. And not only that, I could feel them because they were not using words. And I now realized that I was the one that was translating what they were telling me from my own level of consciousness. I could feel them smiling at me. Uh, I was cared for. I was fully supported on every level. They guided me through the, the healing, asking me to go back in the past to forgive those that wronged me. And like you, Geoff, I've been sexually abused as well when I was a kid. And so I, ha I had to also forgive myself too for those I wronged. And when I said to them, uh, when I, 
when I said to them that those people of the past caused me a lot of suffering, they said, give it to us, Julian. We will get rid of it for you. <laughs> and I was like, I told them I didn't understand what, what they meant. And, and then I felt how they proposed me to do it. I had to actually pull these, these long etheric wire out of my head with my mm. hands until I, like, until I felt like you wouldn't go any further. It would pluck just unplugged like a plug and then I, I i just gave it to them and it was it, it was gone you know hmm. and um much more happened that night but you know it would take too long for me to explain on this podcast but uh, i I'd, I'd love to hear your experience with angelic beings and did it happen on a conscious level and if yes do you do you remember it fully that's me pulling it out okay that's me doing exactly the same, exactly, exactly the same as his instruction as you. Pull it out. We'll deal with it. We'll clean it. You won't clean it. You won't fight the war. You just need to pull it out. Yeah, I've had lots of experiences. I've had, um, I'm writing a book at the moment called How to Over. It's about how to overcome evil with good. It's about how to overcome ignorance with knowledge. How to overcome mm. darkness with light. It's how to. It's ultimately how to convert it into light. So by getting higher consciousness, we're able to not just overcome evil because evil will either uh, scatter away from us because we're a moving river or evil will come in and be converted by us. So even our prosecution will work for us and help us because we're working for the light. So when I started to, I've had lots of angelic experiences. I, had, uh, I did a sound bath once because I've got a block in my damn TN. And um, I'll tell you this story, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. It's, uh, so I'm doing this sound bath, and it's just like a shaman using sound and, and all sorts of different instruments yeah. according to what I said to her. I said, well, I've got an energy stuck. I, I need to process it. It's not coming out. So as she's doing all this stuff, and she's doing all sorts of stuff, singing, and it's very beautiful, but I'm lying there thinking, well, nothing's happening. I've never had this experience before, and I don't think anything is going to happen. And then suddenly... I feel this movement in my dantian, in my tummy. Yeah. And it's like a, like a physically, not like an imagined movement. It's like I had to arch my back. It was, I felt it so mm. much. And then I felt it rising up here to my heart chakra here. <clears throat> and then as it got to here, um, I was suddenly surrounded by four or five a blisk shaped beings like you know like the mr blobby shape mm. i i just thought i wasn't seeing clearly but they were there and they were benevolent and they were beautiful i could feel their love and as this as this thing rose here and it was as real as you putting your hand on my body like mm. that. as it came up my chest gaped open wide and one of these beings reached into me and pulled a child out mm. and the child was slumbering you could say it was my this wounded kid when I was when I was part of me had fallen asleep after when I was abused because I couldn't cope and it lifted it out of me and it wasn't until many years later that I realized that you'd taken it in order to clean it mm -hmm. now I spoke to the shaman afterwards and I said I tried to explain what happened but I couldn't stop weeping I felt the presence of the spirit and I was weeping but I knew something had been taken out of me they were there <clears throat> they were right mm -hmm. there <clears throat> anyway I um it was a very powerful experience and I expanded exponentially again. And then a few years later, I was in Watkins bookshop in London looking at some books and suddenly there was a book in front of me and the beings I'd seen, which, which I couldn't quite articulate. I knew that they were like this kind of Mr. Blobby shape. Mm. Uh, there was, there was drawings of these beings, these exact beings on this book. And I looked at the book and it was a book by mother Mira and she was showing she was doing drawings from the angelic realm and showing these, these healing angels. <clears throat> and we went through the book and every single picture was a picture of these angels that came to me and they were caring for uh, her uncle who died called Mr. Reddy. Um, and they were, they cared for me the same way as they cared for him. These were the beings I'd seen and they were indistinct. The shape of them was indistinct. It wasn't that I couldn't see them clearly. It was just, that was their shape. Mm. Um, then, of course, I did some study and read about Mother Mira. Mother Mira <clears throat> is, is a manifestation or a, 
an avatar for the divine mother. Yeah. And the divine mother is, um, in Christianity, the divine mother is considered to be the Holy Spirit or the Holy Dove. It's the female, it's the female energy. So this female energy came into it. It was so beautiful, Julian, so beautiful. I wept, but it literally carefully went into my body, took this child out. And what I was being shown is that this happens often when we're asleep. We never normally see this. Mm -hmm. This is not something we're normally conscious of. And I was gifted to mm -hmm. see this vision of these angels taking this child out of me um, and cleaning it for me and then putting it back in again. Yeah. So I saw these beings. Um, but then, then there was another time, just to finish on it, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night. I didn't feel right. My body was just felt uh, uneasy, uneasy. I felt uneasy. And then I felt my body adjust like that. I was wide awake. You know, like when you think you hear a burglar. Yeah. Wide, wide awake. It was not like a, a dream. I was wide awake. Then I just heard this boom, boom, boom. And I felt these lights. I, I saw these lights mm. in my body and they light up. And I came out of my body. Mm. I literally came out of my body. And I floated up. I went to a cloud. And then suddenly I was in this other realm. And I was in a, in a square with a, a cobbled square with lots of other people. They couldn't see me, but I could see them. And there was a guru on stage in this open square. And he was delivering the paradoxical commandments. And he was talking to me. You will serve people and they will attack you for your service. Serve them anyway. Mm. You will love people. They will hate you for your love. Love them anyway. You know, you will serve people and they will accuse you of agenda. Serve them anyway. And it was saying to me, you know, you're going to, in, you're, you are a shepherd. Mm. And uh, a shepherd is an abomination to any wolf. So you will be attacked, but you will overcome that attack with love, with love, with love. So it's, and then I realized after, after I looked up, because I didn't, I, I understood what it meant. I knew what it was telling mm. me. I'm in a life of service and some people are not going to like you because you're delivering light and it will be an offense to them. Um, but he said, you will overcome that by constantly having compassion for them, constantly understanding that they're not themselves, constantly serving constantly keeping that river flowing. They will be swept away by the river of spirit if you just keep serving. So I came back into my body and I was wide awake. I went to sleep, got up in the morning and those paradoxical commandments were still talking in my head as I went to the toilet. Mm. I went online and looked them up and um, I recognised that um, Sister, uh, Sister Teresa of Avilia and Mother Teresa of Avilia had the paradoxical commandments listed on the wall in her office. Sister Teresa is another manifestation of the Divine Mother. The Divine Mother is a simile for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Dove. So again, I was being taught directly, directly by the Holy Dove. Mm. And it was saying, you are going to serve and people are going to attack you. Love them. Amazing. Thank you very much, Geoff. That was now, my, my pleasure. It's so lovely to talk to you. You're, you're very inspiring. I love your knowledge. Mostly what I love about you is not that. It's that you're doing the work. Thank you. Just keep doing the work. And anybody that's listening and out there, you know, it's not enough to know this stuff. If we're not doing yeah. the work, it's, 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 just, it's just like a, what Shakespeare would call a giant's robe on a dwarfish thief. Mm. You know, we, we, if we want to wear the crown, we need to make ourselves royal. You know, we need to make ourselves holy. And that just means working every day. They call it the, the hundred little deaths every day. So every single day we convert a little bit of darkness in mm. us into light. Uh, the, great, the great work of spiritual alchemy and transmutation. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Amazing, amazing. Well, Jock... Thank you for having me on. And if you don't mind, if you could give it to Gabriella so we can share it Absolutely. on our... Absolutely, um, yes. I'd, that would be really kind. Much. I'd appreciate it. Awesome. All right, Julian. Thank you very much, Geoff. Have a lovely you. day. Thank you, mate. See Thank you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.